Yeah, we've got just over 20 minutes for some questions. Uh, let's, let's go. We'll take uh, three and then we'll get some responses and see how far we can get. Oh, thank you. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Julian Messina. Um, thanks for the, the very, very interesting presentations. I have a question for each of you. Uh, so for Valentina, um, I, I like the paper a lot. I wonder, um, this is not very well suited to the diff in diff that you're doing, but um, do you observe that there are in general more applicants interested in STEM, more women applicants interested in STEM after the policy was introduced? The question is, is this policy, maybe I don't need this, is this policy actually uh, simply shifting women towards those two universities that introduce the quarters and the programs, or is actually making women more interested in uh, following STEM. To the question, to, to the paper on, on Tunisia, uh, which I, I, I found very interesting, it's very interesting how similar the results for Tunisia are for some of the things that we've done uh, in Latin America. One um, aspect that surprised me, but this is my ignorance of Tunisia's labor market, is that you don't talk anything about in, uh, informality, which is a big issue in Latin America. So we're wondering, whether that's something uh, that you are considering analysis or whether this is a non-issue in, in Tunisia. And the, for the paper in Costa Rica, I had maybe one suggestion, I think following something similar to what the Tunisian paper, considering that you're going to have this very, very different non-participation of women in different parts of the distribution, maybe you want to do some of these Oaxaca well, blind the compositions that you're doing across the distribution and see whether those wage gaps in those areas where the differential participation has not been that important at the top or in the, uh, you know, in the upper half of the distribution, uh, how those results look like. I think that would be interesting. Thank you. Anybody else here in this neighborhood? Uh, just to add to that uh, from the chair, uh, also, just formally, uh, one can do the Oaxaca blinder on the participation itself, right? On the change in the, uh, in the participation rate. It just seems like it's an extremely important margin, besides earnings, actually. Yeah. We, we corrected by the, the, the probability yes. of the but, market, but not necessarily that the composition. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I can speak from here. Okay. <laughs> So my question is for the first speaker. I was listening to the, the way you apply the difference in difference at estimator, and it kind of occurred to me that there may be some omitted bias in terms of the quality or the intensity or the or the difficulty of schoolwork. For example, I I also I teach undergraduate student. If if in a particular year I have my average at eighty percent of the score, and then the following year I have like sixty then it means the group of students I have now, for lack of better word, yeah, that's not a good word to use. It means that, <laughs> I was going to say low quality, but, <laughs> so what you do is you kept the grade. Are we picking the fact, I, I'm concerned about the dropout rate. Are we picking the fact that we are improving the grade, which is giving incentive to students to stay in the program and not drop out because we reduce the quality of education? If, for like, if, if you get where I'm coming from. Because over the years, you sometimes have to cut the grade. Like I just finished grading before coming here, and I have to add 10 points <laughs> to, to literally cut the grade. So what that means is that I, I can still have students taking my course, but is it because I'm trying to, because if I have students performing like 90% percentile, then I don't have to cut the grade. They mean I have high quality students for that year. But the next year, now we have, I'm not saying female students, may not perform as much, but I, can you control for quality of or the intensity of, of the educational experience and see if that is the effect you are picking instead of the signal that the university are sending. I, what I'm saying is the signal the university is sending may not completely explain the dropout rate. The quality of education might, might also be a factor. Thank you. My question is for Valentina. Thank you for that paper. Uh, we have affirmative action in my country, so I was quite keen to learn. It's not based on gender, it's based on ethnicity. So I was quite keen to learn from your experience. Now the first point which I wanted to raise was 
the question of the duration. You didn't tell us when it was introduced and for how long uh, this policy is going to be in place. In most cases, when you do have affirmative action, the question of duration comes up. And the question of duration comes up because there's a specific reason for that. If you have long-term implementation of the policy, you can have drawbacks. So I wanted to push you on that point on duration and whether that issue was discussed at all when you were implementing it in Chile. Uh, in Chile, is it? Yeah. The second question was on the curriculum. I thought this was very interesting. You're changing the curriculum to accommodate women's preferences to get women more interested in the course. While I'm all for curriculum uh, revisions, my question is this, what are the implications of this on the quality of the course? This is a professional course. And if you change the content of the curriculum, does it then reduce the core to such a point that you may actually be compromising the quality of uh, the engineering course that you're providing for the students? Those are my two questions for you. For the question on Tunisia, you raised the point about politics, and you said politics is very important. But I'm sorry, I, I, I must have missed it. But I didn't get how politics was so important because it didn't come out in the conclusion too. So could you tell us how does the politics fit into your analysis? Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll come there now. No. Next round. So where, where should we start? Okay, so I'll start. Um, so the first question is about uh, the trends, I guess. So it's uh, universities that implemented the policy versus the ones that didn't. Uh, and this is, of course, a question that I've asked myself several times. It's not so easy to answer. Um, so the first thing that I would say is that um, so it's a diff in diff, and what we're seeing is that there is a, an increase in the proportion of females attending engineering schools in the two, two treated schools. And the, the trend for the control, it, it remains the same. So at least we're not seeing like changes. Yeah, exactly. We're not seeing something crazy there. Still, there could be some, some effects going on. But the, the problem is that they are difficult to disentangle. Because you would say, are there women who are choosing at these universities, but they would have gone to STEM anyway? Um, this is something that I could potentially see because I see their applications. So I see their applications in the first choice, and I can see what they would have gone to if they didn't go to the uh, Uchile or PUC. I can see that. But because they decided what to apply for, they decided to put the University of Chile as the first option, uh, I, I, they made up their mind about studying. I, they might have made up their mind about studying engineering. I see this policy. I see that engineering, the, the, the best engineering school in, in Chile is, is calling more women to study there. So maybe engineering is for me. I'm going to apply to there first, and then I'm going to apply to maybe a, another university. So it might be that still, although their, their second option is a STEM degree, it wouldn't have been without the policy. So that's, that's why it's a bit difficult to disentangle. Uh, I would say still that these results are relevant even if these schools are, are stealing uh, women from other schools because these are the two best schools in the country. And that means that the graduates from this school are also the ones who make the highest wages. So it's still contributing to reduce gender wage, potentially is contributing to reduce uh, gender wage gap. Um, so the other question about uh, quality and if it's uh, maybe changing how uh, this, the professors are grading. I think this is an excellent question. Uh, the, the thing is that I have variation within cohort, and I, I didn't mention this, but these are, there, are, there are several classrooms in each cohort, and there is variation of gender composition within those classrooms. And the tests that they have to take are the same tests. And the grades are standardized between the whole group. So even if there are groups with more women who might be not as well prepared as their male peers or as their other female peers, uh, they're still subject to the same level of uh, quality demands from uh, the professors. 
So in that way, I'm, I think uh, I'm not having that problem that much. I still think that maybe I should, uh, because I am, I mean, I, I have also um, several cohorts, and I have cohort fixed effects too. So I, I don't think that's what uh, this, this is showing. I, I, I think it's more of a preferences for being with more women. And then the policy questions. I think the policy questions are very interesting, So, but uh, they are a bit out of the scope of my work. So the, the policy was implemented in 2014, and that means this is a six-year degree. It's a very long uh, degree of studying engineering in, in Chile. So we are starting now to see the first cohorts of women graduating. Uh, the policy is still in place. I don't know until when it's going to be in place, but yeah, the, the, the the idea is that it is a temporary policy. Uh, temporary until when, I'm not sure. And about the courses, if the changes in curriculum would affect overall quality of the degree, um, I don't know, but what I do know is that uh, they shouldn't, so the curriculum, uh, it means that they have like minors in this, so there is a minor in biomedicine. Uh, so. I guess if the students who are choosing this minor, the, the students who are choosing the minor, this minor would be affected by, by the change, but the ones who are not choosing this minor wouldn't. So it shouldn't have negative effects on, on those students, I think. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not really um, studying that part and, and I don't have data from the students in that university. I only have data from, for the students in, in the uh, other university. Thank you. Um, so on the similarity between, uh, I think many countries had the same story of increase of uh, tertiary education and uh, structural change that wasn't uh, at the same pace, so probably kept economies at the same style and then uh, education premium decreased because the supply is higher than the demand. So this maybe explains why there is this kind of similarity. On the informal labor, you, you're totally right. I think this is, of course, it's very important in Tunisia as uh, in the old MENA region. So this is a good point. We can try to see uh, what's the contribution of the change. And many people think that after the revolution, most of the jobs were created in the public sector or in the informal sector because growth was very low. So probably both created jobs, and I think it, we can get interesting results to look at the informal part. Uh, on politics, so what happened is that after the revolution, the social pressure was very high, and so the government totally changed its uh, employment and wage policy. The, the employment policy was, uh, in the decade before, was favoring the high-skilled, uh, so the, 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 the number of high skilled was increasing in the administration and the, their wages was increasing while the wage of low and medium skilled was decreasing. After the revolution, this was totally inverted. So the government decided to increase the wages of the low skilled. And for the um, employment, actually what happened is that many people were working for the government without contracts. So, or had these kind of temporary contracts uh, under huge demonstrations and mov social movements, the, the government decided to, to make all these people civil servants, which created a very huge wage bill. Actually, some people say that Tunisia had probably the highest wage bill uh, in terms of GDP, or one of the highest in the world, at least. This is one of the problems in the negotiations with the IMF today. But uh, th this is how uh, politics entered the, the story, by uh, this very uh, rapid change. In my, case, in my case, it was just a comment, but I, I appreciate your comment, and I will take a, the comment specifically, maybe to use, you are right, to use the dropout, the dropout rate, maybe as a control, or we can use an, an heterogeneity uh, test, and we have many options. The good thing is this method is pretty fl flexible, and we have this data, we can more, we can do more tests and try to incorporate this important factor, which definitely is one of the main predictors of the uh, differences in, in salaries and the gender pay gap during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Great. Excellent uh, questions and excellent answers. We've got some time for some more. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Edson. I have two questions, one question for Muhammad, 
Mohamed, is, is it okay? And one question for Luis. Uh, my question for Mohamed is that uh, you have presented to us the like the good the good uh, a good scenario where in inequality has decreased. But I would like to know if this has compromised uh, any other economic uh, performance. I don't know. Maybe the growth of the economy have decreased. Maybe the public sector have obtained high levels of debt, or I don't know. I would like to know how has done uh, Tunisia to increase the 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 public uh, the public spend. Uh, to know, in order to have like a bigger picture. Uh, my question for Luis is that your final conclusion, I, in my opinion, I agree because at the beginning I saw that you presented to us an image where we had the informality and we saw that the levels of informality in male were higher than in female. So like a first idea that, that could explain that the women uh, decreased less the salaries than men, but uh, my question is that I don't know why that would explain that difference if you are using the headman corrector, if the headman isn't tries uh, to reduce the bias generated by the drops in the in the sample. So I don't know why the headman corrector would not be correcting uh, that bias. It's not sure to me. It's not clear to me. Thank you for your question. Uh, definitely, um, the idea to use Heckman was to try to correct, uh, especially Heckman, as, as, you, as you know, uh, correct for the probability, which characteristics influence uh, the probability to be into the labor market. We partially correct uh, using this kind of um, um, methodological uh, tool but not necessarily, because it's pretty difficult to capture uh, these movements in the labor market because there are mm, pretty speed movements, maybe because of this uh, uh, kind of uh, rate of dropout, um, period by period is more accurate to measure the influence of, of this, not just considering the entire effect. Uh, maybe it's better to do it period by period. It's a, it's a, good, uh, um, it's a good recommendation for our uh, work. But we try it to do it definitely, and Heckman partially correct, uh, considering all, all these characteristics, also informality, as you said, because we use this uh, predictor as part of our uh, estimation. And regarding your comments, uh, definitely they are pretty pretty useful uh, as well. Some of the shortcomings we have limitations because we don't have mm, maybe we don't have this uh, specific information about the change or the shift from one uh, industry or sector to another one. If I understand, if I understand well. But uh, we have, um, maybe we can try it 
to do it um, a more, um, try to understand, uh, this is part of our um, work, to try to understand the mechanism and try to go deeper in the um, predictors, in the um, characteristics, in the endowments that explain these changes. And this is part of the job uh, today, because of the time it was impossible to, to show you. But for example, uh, some of the uh, predictors who explain the, the gap, and specifically during the part of the, regard, related to the COVID-19 pandemic, was the occupation, the level of skills, for example. And maybe this is related with your concern, and that is, is also our concern. We have to go deeper and try to uh, under, understand and try to correct in a better way to take it into account. Thank you very much. It's okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Re regarding your question, so there are really two periods, very distinct. Uh, before the revolution, the economic situation was quite good. Unemployment uh, figures were bad. Uh, but public debt, for example, was very low, like uh, less than 35% of GDP. Today, uh, public debt is around 90% of GDP. So what happened is that the country bought social peace at the depend of its uh, debt situation. I mean, the government, of course, is not sustainable anymore. And today it has an IMF program and the, the negotiations with the IMF are very complex. So... Uh, but inequality decreased more in the first period, so we cannot say that inequality is, uh, the decrease of inequality is responsible of the problems. However, when you buy it uh, with civil servants uh, hiring, of course, in that case, it's, uh, it's very expensive for the country. And it's very risky because today, the situation, especially with COVID and the war in Ukraine, it's, it's not any more sustainable because the country also subsidizes energy and uh, bread and all these uh, basic products. So the, the deficit is becoming totally unsustainable. And the situation is very unclear for the next month and weeks even. Okay, wonderful. So uh, that wasn't a wonderful conclusion, though. That was pretty uh, daunting for Tunisia, right? Um, uh, anyway, uh, th thank you. We had an inspirational message about uh, solving the gender gap. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, and a, a very interesting session covering a range of issues on, on inequality, including policy issues. And the second installment is to come tomorrow, the second in our IA, uh, UNU wider uh, partnership, technology and, and inequality in the labor market, tomorrow morning. But thank you very much to, uh, to the, our pre presenters, excellent presentations, and to you.